So I was blessed to meet Dr. Jasmine Predacito and an artist, I mean me, and I, I just, oh yeah, talk to me lady, tell me what you're up to. Um, and I was blown away by what she has created and what her mission in life is. So it made perfect sense to invite her to come along. And she said that her title, it's only when it becomes personal that's when you get in action. Mm -hmm. How I became a pioneering environmental activist through art. So I'm gonna stop my share now and I'm gonna invite Jasmine to come on stage um, and share with us what your thoughts are. Uh, thank you so much, Jill. And what a wonderfully tough act to follow. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you for giving of your time. Before I actually, I don't want to talk too much about myself, but I do want to, because I am an artist, and of course, so much of my work is about the visual. There is one short story I do want to tell you. Um, I'm, I'll mention that one in a minute, but um, let me just get right. So these are, I'll tell you how I got to where, I, where I've got in a moment, but it's not so much about me or us that I'm thinking about. My, my, I call myself an accidental activist of anything. So this is something that has snuck up on me. And the story is everything, as we just heard Gina say. And then, of course, um, I think it was Louise at the beginning with the breath. The things that we take for granted. And this is a cyanotype. It's a, it's a piece of work. It's basically, when you look at engineering blueprints, they were created in this way. So this was created with sunlight. And it's uh, one of my sculptures, which is made from wood that was hit by lightning and material that actually absorbs pollution from the air. And I've called it the bird who lost its song. And it's one of the saddest stories that I've heard really, and I'm developing a series of work on it. But it's about an Australian bird called the honey badger bird, who has so few of his compatriots around him that he is forgetting how to sing. And environmentally, this is obviously quite tragic, but it suddenly occurred to me that this is a metaphor for where we are as a species because if we can no longer sing to each other, we would effectively become extinct. So who am I? So I will give you a, a little bit of background. So um, when Louise was talking about the breath, again, it's something, this became enormously personal to me five years ago or so. So just a very quick, very quick background. I uh, grew up with immigrant parents, as an immigrant child, you are expected to either be a doctor, a lawyer, or you know one of those established types of professions. I wanted to be an artist, but that wasn't gonna happen. The long and the short of it over <laughs> a very interesting path, shall we say. I ended up doing a physics PhD at UCL, but in the evenings I was studying art. Now this is at a time when science and art was seen as completely separate. So I did these things very, very separately. And I kind of realized, although people kept saying to me, um, I don't understand how you think the way that you think, how can they be one and the same thing? For me, they are, they are all about the natural world. They're all about our connection to each other. In science, things are limited by the natural laws. In art, we can create our own. But it's all about the, the creative thinking. So anyway, yeah, I was kind of doing that and creating art and came out of UCL with this wonderful shiny PhD thinking I never want to do physics research again. I'm far too chaotic to be a researcher. And then I set up with a, a partner, which I don't really do it anymore. Probably one of the first outreach companies in the UK, which was going, actually, I think we were one of the first, which was going around the country working with kids. And we were trying to take the fear out of science. And uh, this kind of is also because I had my son, who's now 23, and it was very important for me to be present for him. My, my family had not been terribly present for me. So it was a way that I could work, I could create my art and bring up Kieran. And as the time went on, I, I remember I became very interested in, in creative thinking. I remember reading that, I mean, I had the, the pleasure to meet Ken Robinson once, a wonderfully divergent thinker. And NASA did an amazing amount of research in the 1970s. And until about the age of seven, we are all effectively, in terms of divergent thinking, we're all effectively geniuses. And of course, by the time we become adults, it's only 2%. So this started to interest me. I thought, why, why does this happen? And at the time, I think there were only two books on creative thinking. If I ever had time, I would sit and write a book. And it's probably something I will do eventually, but I am a maker. 
And um, I kind of realized that one, it's, it's, you know, the longer you do things, the more dots you have to join in your head, the more creative you become. And when I'm saying creativity, I'm not, obviously I'm an artist, I make things, but we are creative in the morning when we decide what we're going to wear, when we open the fridge and we decide, you know, how we're going to put something together. And in order to shift the world, and we do really need to shift the world, and we all know that, these big creative paradigm shifting acts, I'm a great believer, happen from teeny tiny acts every day, or acts that we kind of, you know, have in our professions. And that's one of the reasons I'm here, and I'm so grateful to be here, because when you find kindred thinkers, you know, for a long, long time, I felt so incredibly isolated. I didn't even know what a polymath was until somebody pointed out to me that I was one. But when you start to find people who think like you, it's, it's wonderful. You suddenly don't feel lonely anymore. And as I say, for me, after 20 years of working with kids and, and Kieran having a major asthma attack five years ago, which is when it became incredibly personal for me, I realized that I was now compelled as an artist and um, do please look up my work. It's so much easier just to go and see. I was compelled as an artist to try and create work that would deliver narratives. You know, I'd been a physicist. I understood data and science. I wrote an essay about climate change, I think 25 years ago. Nothing much has changed in terms of our understanding. But what I realized is that it's when it's, you can make something incredibly personal when you create a piece of art out of it. And this is where the sort of accidental activism, if you like, has, has come from. One, my, my compulsion to create something that will stop people in their tracks, start to take things a little bit more for granted. And, you know, from the science point of view, I know that this is something we have to do as a species. And so, as I say, five years ago, it became incredibly personal. Kieran had a, a massive asthma attack, which he'd never had before. And it was the first time sitting in A&E that I actually started to think about the nature of the breath. You know, I'm not a meditator. I'm not a yogi. I meditate when I'm making my work, I realize. And I suddenly thought, oh my goodness, we don't think about the most fundamental things that we need to sustain ourselves. And serendipity being what it is, it's, it's one of my favorite words for a reason. A year later, I was commissioned to create a sculpture for Euston. Now, I had never made a public art sculpture. When, when, I, when I listened to people talking about doing stuff outside your comfort zone, I've spent my whole life doing stuff outside my comfort zone, much to the chagrin of my family, to be honest, because, you know, had I gone into physics, I probably would have made a very tidy living as an artist. It, it's always a struggle. But, yeah, a year later, I met an amazing engineering company that had developed a material which they found as a side effect, it's, it's had all the scientific measurements done on it, that it could absorb NOx pollution. Now, NOx is the byproduct of combustion. You get it from um, factories, you get it from cars. You actually have even more pollution probably in your homes than outside very often. And a three kilogram sculpture, for example, can absorb um, the NOx in an average size room for 60 years. Now, I remember thinking, why doesn't everyone know this? And I suddenly realized that as much as everyone asks for innovation in science or they ask for the avant-garde in art, they don't know what to do with you when you're doing things like that. Um, it's getting better now, post-COVID. So yeah, I took this geopolymer, it's, it's a byproduct of quarrying, and the last four years I've been pioneering how to create sculpture from it. One, I mean, this is not the answer to, the, to our pollution problems. It's just like I know that recycling is not the answer to our consumption. We need to consume less. That's, that's the answer to things. But I wanted to demonstrate that we have the materials if we can be divergent in our thinking and approach problems from you know, a complete left of center way. And one of my greatest joys is when I get in a room with people who don't think like me. I, I'm so open to it all. And, you know, as the years have gone on, by the way, this is my son's hands holding his asthma puffer. It was just shortlisted for, for a prize. And on the right is Breathe, which is above Camden People's Theatre. And, and she, she's a figure that is lifting her head to try and take a breath. Now, I don't know if she's breathing or smothered. An awful lot of my work kind of veers between the enormously dystopian and the possible utopian future. And I'm fine with that. That's how physicists think, you think, you know, the, the paradox is everything. But we do have the innovations. We do have the solutions. And 
when, when I was when I met Jill, when I met Mark, I was saying my frustration is that you know we, there's a missing bit in the middle. We either have you know we need investment companies, we need sustainability, we need companies who want to be more ethical, who want to do things where it's not simply about the bottom line and the profit. You know when we start to see the environment as a stakeholder. Um, it becomes entirely different. I remember reading quite recently that 80% of the FTSE 500 companies, were they to have to pay for the, the natural capital, the natural you know, the, the assets and things that they've used, they would no longer be these enormous corporations. And um, it's not, well, capitalism is something that, that that's a discussion for another time, but we do have to think differently about how we value things in the way that when I kind of saw Kieran struggling for breath, I thought, Oh my goodness, I'd never ever thought about the, the nature of the breath before. Jill, I haven't been timing myself at all. Can you just give me a clue? <laughs> Is she still there? No. <laughs> yes, I'm still here. Um, you've got about five minutes, my darling, so you can. Okay, thank you. Because once, 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 once I'm storytelling, I forget. Thank I you. know. <laughs> Carry on. Um, oh, I can't remember what was the very last slide. Uh, so then that brings me on to yes, this is where. Um, you know, I've started to also understand that it's not just about our connections to each other. Um, last year, the, the Euston project was taking so long. Um, you know, I've learned so much about how much resistance there is to change. I really, really have that I had to put it to one side for a while because I was starting to suffer anxiety from that project. Not because I hadn't made the sculpture, I'd finished it, but it was trying to get it in place. And so last year, a beautiful thing happened, um, which I hadn't expected. And the Horniman Museum Gardens is just up the road from me. And I was building a sculpture in the garden during, during quarantine. And I had learned from a beekeeper friend, this is what I'm saying about knowing all these wonderful divergent thinkers, that bees cannot find their flowers when there's too much pollution in the air. You know, they can't, they can't actually sniff them out, if you like. And, you know, again, these two, these two dots joined in my head. And I thought, God, wouldn't it be great to create a sculpture that goes into a garden that hopefully will absorb enough of the pollution to help, you know, the, the pollinating creatures find their flowers. Because again, most people don't realize that one in every three mouthfuls of food comes from a pollinating creature. In China, they have so few bees left, they actually have to truckload undergraduates in who stand on ladders with feathers to hand pollinate the trees. That's how desperate it, you know, it is. So anyway, yeah, the Horniman created this amazing bee garden out of old pallets. They created um, bee hotels. Uh, you can see on the left, that's uh, we did some drone footage. And in the middle is, is my girl, flower girl. I called her flower girl, she is sleeping the petals are around her because I'm hoping one day she will awaken when the bees return and it's because the Horniman a bit like Breathe which is on the second most polluted road in the UK the Horniman is on the South Circular so it has an enormous amount of pollution coming off it but since then since having worked with the horticulturalist the, the amazing Wesley Shaw who created this bee garden for me I have now started to understand the value even of topsoil, you know, topsoil is more valuable than gold. Without it, we effectively have deserts. You know, water is starting to be being, being traded on the stock market. And this is what worries me, that if people aren't aware that the most fundamental of their needs are, are things that are up for grabs, that they, they won't do anything about it. So I'm trying to get this message across through art. Um, I'm looking for people who are interested in messaging like this. I know that more and more companies are starting to understand that they need to create narratives that people can understand. There's, there's no point with spreadsheets and graphs and numbers and things. And I honestly do believe that art is that thing. It's, 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 to, it's the thing that will take us into the next revolution. So really to kind of bring it all to a close, one of my favorite writers is Dan Pink, who was one of the speech writers for the White House. And he wrote a brilliant book called The Future Belongs to Right-Hand Side Thinkers, which is a little simplistic, because of course we're not just one side or the other. But one of the paragraphs in it has always moved me because he said, you know, the past belonged to the accountants, the money movers, you know, the machine makers, but the future belongs to the poets and the artists and the empathizers and the carers. And I really do 
believe in that because in an era in which in which we have AI, we have machine learning, we have things that will do the mundane that we don't want to do. It's the, it's that creativity, it's that thing that which is actually one of the best things about being human. We were drawing on cable walls long be before we had language. And that's the future that I'm hoping that we can actually attain and create because in that way, you start to take care of the things that are the most valuable, which for me is the environment. And with that, Jill, I will, I will stop speaking. So thank you so much for listening, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Jasmine. That's, uh, again, so much that I've written down that, that makes perfect sense. And um, every month we have um, a theme, not a chosen theme, but one that emerges throughout the, the afternoon. Um, and it's, it's being creative, ironically. Um, and it, it kind of makes sense. Everything you've said, is it dystopian or utopian future? Th these are our choices. Um, and how many people have resistance to change? Um, we are going straight into a breakout session now where people can get to have a chat with each other, get to know, learn about each other. But I'd like to use this as an opportunity to discuss what you've just shared with us. So is there a question that you think you would like to pose for people to start their conversation? Is there is anything... That or is yeah. that to Gina? Yeah, to you, Jasmine. Is there anything you would like to pose to people to sort of set them off on this conversation? You know, how, how might they tackle this? I was I would say, how many people are prepared to play again? That's one of the questions I would ask. How many people are prepared to play? Play. Play. Yes, play. Yeah. Literally play in what they're doing. Thank yeah. you, Jill. Yeah, thank you so much, Jasmine. Big round of applause for Jasmine. Thank you very much.